All right, uh, hello everybody. Thanks for coming. It's uh, nice to see so many people here. Uh, just a short introduction. My name is Adrian Alic. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Definity. So my main time is actually spent writing Rust, which I'm really thankful for. And uh, today I'll be talking about concurrent data structures. And uh, I recently wrote a crate, which is incredibly cursed. Uh, but it, I'll use it as a case study reference uh, throughout this presentation. Um, right, so it's an MPSC queue, and for anyone who doesn't know, uh, MPSC stands for multi-producer single consumer queue. Um, and basically what it means is that we have multiple concurrent producers uh, push some kind of data into a shared queue, so they have some kind of data stream, and uh, it happens concurrently or in parallel, and uh, the consumer is a single entity and uh, it needs to process these e events in some kind of uh, like serial form. Um, and the uh, problem with this is how we deal with the concurrency of the producers. So how, how do we achieve uh, this form of communication? And um, yeah, we'll go over like several details. So first of all, we'll um, think a bit about how to write such a queue in Rust, uh, how to make it fast. So I'll talk a bit about a few optimizations you can use, and uh, then also how to reason about correctness, because uh, anything relating to unsafe data structures uh, is a bit of a minefield. And uh, I would like to motivate this with an example. And the previous talk is actually quite relevant. So uh, basically, at a bare metal system, uh, a small SOC, a RISC-V based multi-core system, and uh, I needed to write a printf command. Uh, but the problem is I don't have a Linux operating system. It was pure bare metal. And um, right, I don't have anything um, except just my pure instructions and pure memory access. So this is like an example of how it would look like. Um, on the right side, this is like a sci-5 uh, SOC, five cores, and um, this printf command was supposed to uh, be used by my bootloader and my um, bare metal task scheduler to just uh, print messages to a, a serial port, so I can have um, like just some kind of information on what my cores are doing. Uh, but the problem is that the UART is a serial device, and all of these five cores are um, working in parallel, so um, this presents a like it presents basically a race over the UART. So there needs to be some form of synchronization. And uh, there are many ways to achieve it. The most common way, uh, the most simple way, I guess, uh, if you have an operating system or threading or some kind of task system is to use uh, a form of mutex, or you can have all of the five cores spin on an atomic variable, like sem semaphore, or, um, and then just uh, organize the access to the UART this way. Um, right, but there is a problem with this, and I visualized it here. So it, the problem with with kind of any kind of locking, and that applies both to mutexes or also to uh, spin locks, is that um, it, let's say we have three uh, processes, and in green I mark the tasks that they're executing. So the first process would uh, execute uh, some kind of task in green, then um, interrupt itself, and then, then just print something uh, to to the UART and then resume its task again. And the second process wants to do the same thing, but can't do it because um, the UART is currently locked, so it incurs a bit of latency. And uh, the same thing also happens for the, the third process, in which case, because of the way uh, we, we, we resolve or uh, we um, like uh, give away, again, access to the UART, um, can depend on some kind of priority. Uh, sometimes we can have an unfortunate situation where one task will basically have a, um, an, an unpredictable amount of latency added, um, which basically blocks itself until it can access the print command again. So um, this is, and the, the interesting thing is like this doesn't only apply to spin locks, right? If, if we have, for instance, the second process, uh, after it sees that it can't print anymore, it can print itself uh, and, and then just... Um, the, the operating system can patch in another uh, task. The problem is, while we maintain utilization and throughput, uh, we do increase latency in any case. So if you have, uh, if, if it's in your best interest to reduce latency, um, then th this type of locking will cause unpredictable jitter. And um, yeah, the idea is how we would uh, maybe avoid such an uh, unfortunate case. And I realize that this is a bit of overkill because I'm just writing a bootloader debugger. Uh, I, I really don't need to write wait three 
MPSC queues to, to just print output to my terminal. Um, but the idea is still pretty useful because um, there is something to be said about low overhead uh, debuggers or tracing tools or any kind of things where you want to print out messages in a serialized form. Uh, because sometimes um, you want to maybe measure a certain pathological performance case or just um, yeah, understand how, what your system is doing. But once you start measuring, you are altering uh, like how the system behaves and introducing noise. So uh, you might increase the like, variance in your measurements and increase the noise floor and suddenly your signal goes away. So uh, having some kind of low overhead uh, debugging can absolutely help in many cases. Um, which is why these weight-free uh, queues are very practical. Um, right, so this would be uh, just an example of how you would maybe design an MPSC queue. There are many ways um, and there are many trade-offs. So one trade-off you can make is to say that uh, you have a fixed size, um, like your queue is not unbounded, it's actually bounded. And maybe you can also say that it has fail on overflow behavior, meaning that once the queue is full, uh, you can't write to it anymore. Um, right. This would be like one characterization, uh, which I chose in my case. So we have, um, like the design is basically for every single producer, um, we have a single T4 ring buffer uh, allocated, which is uh, solely owned by the producer, and the producer pushes data to this um, thread local T4 ring buffer, and the consumer pulls it. And uh, the nice thing about this is that the um, synchronization, uh, like the synchronization mechanisms, and the um, the like the workings of how memory is shared is very well understood for these ring buffers, so they can be um, written in a relatively safe way. Um, right. So an example of how you'd write a ring buffer in Rust would be, um, and I call this like TLQ, which just, just uh, stands for Thread Local Queue, and uh, one way you can do it is to just have a buffer, uh, which is a vector of bytes. If you like pointer in direction, which I think you don't, uh, then you just uh, also save the head and tail in there, um, which basically tell you uh, how full the queue is. Uh, or another way, if you know the size of the buffer at compile time, you can just um, parameterize your, your buffer with, with a um, const generic, and then f f uh, have a fixed size array there. But there's a, a problem with this approach, and that happens once you introduce multiple producers. Um, so let's say you have an MPSC queue and you allocate a huge chunk and you have multiple of those in an array stored. So your memory layout will look a bit like this. Um, this, is, this is a queue that has an array of thread local queues and we store the buffer, then the head, then the tail, and then the buffer again. And uh, this has a bit of a uh, like cache locality problem for uh, certain kinds of traversals. For instance, the consumer uh, needs to actually traverse both head and the tail of every single producer in order to find out if a queue is empty or full or has elements in it. So what you want to do is um, like basically, uh, the problem especially with this is that if the buffer is large, which it generally is, then you introduce a cache miss. And not only that, uh, because we're uh, doing a concurrent data structure, a cache miss will also mean maybe an atomic transaction, like an atomic uh, uh, load, which incurs additional cache coherency traffic, and that has uh, even more severe um, impact uh, than a pure cache miss in some cases. So this is something that is really rough, and uh, this is also something you will find often in game development, um, ECS style game development, where you have a big struct, lots of uh, fields in it, and you want to, um, you have an array of all of these structs, and you want to iterate through a particular field of all of these um, objects. And um, to fix this, uh, there is something called struct of arrays. Um, and what we do here is very relatively simple. Instead of having one structure that stores everything in the thread local queue, we separate out the offsets, which that's what I refer to as the head and tail. Um, they're offsets. So this is like one structure. And then the buffer is its own thing. And then instead of storing in the queue an array of TLQs, you store an array of offsets and an array of buffers. Um, and I use const generics everywhere, in my code especially. Um, it can look very ugly at some point, uh, right, but I love it. And uh, th this is how it would look like once you, once you 
just change your layout. So um, the consumer can then just with one read get all the heads and tails in it, if, especially if they fit in, a, fit in a cache line, and then iterate over heads and tails. So um, this is already uh, one way you can um, improve your, your memory layout so that it matches the way you access and traverse your data structure. Um, so this is generally applicable. And uh, Zig actually has uh, built-in support for, um, like, for, for changing array of structs, the structs array, like uh, changing between them. Uh, Rust does not have that yet, but maybe it will be uh, at some point in the future. Uh, right, and with this, we can um, now take a step back and think a bit about memory. Um, the reason is that, okay, so now we have the, just the basic data structure, but there are some problems. And that is that uh, a lot of times when you're writing a concurrent data structure, especially if it needs to be very performant, uh, Writing unsafe code is, uh, code is quite nice, uh, but especially when dealing with concurrency, um, the failure modes are sometimes very, very difficult to understand. Uh, they're difficult to debug, and sometimes they happen very, very rarely and only on certain architectures. So if you make a mistake with memory models, uh, it will be very, very painful. And sometimes you won't notice that your code is actually completely undefined behavior. And, uh, right, I, I can give you an example. Uh, the first prototype of my queue was written um, on the basis of at least my faulty understanding of memory models, which was based on how x86 processors behave. Um, so I just, uh, I, was just like, I just sprinkled ordering relaxed all over uh, my queue everywhere, like pepper. And uh, of course it blew up once I ported it to my MacBook because it has a different memory model. And um, yeah, basically I didn't realize that what I actually want to write is portable software and, and correct software. And I didn't realize that uh, the semantics I chose to develop against were um, like incorrect. I was, I was developing against the x86 semantics in which you can't reorder stores in a store buffer or loads in a load buffer. Um, right, and it doesn't stop there, of course. This is like a table um, where you can see um, on the top, you have all kinds of different processor architectures and um, the x86 is actually one of the most uh, one of the most conservative out of all of the these out of order processors. Um, yeah, it basically doesn't reorder its instructions that aggressively. Uh, all of these other risk chips, uh, MIPS, Power, ARM, uh, they're much more aggressive. And the alpha, uh, which is a very fitting name because it's completely insane, it also uh, reorders dependent loads. Um, yeah, which is an absolute maniac. So. Uh, good name choice for this instruction uh, architecture. Um, right, so basically hardware is very varied and uh, most of the time people won't actually want to write portable software and not only uh, software that is geared towards a specific semantics. So we, I needed to change my thinking. Um, I needed to develop against a language semantics. And uh, this is where the C11 memory model comes in. So Rust does not have a formally uh, very formally specified memory model, but uh, currently just uh, copies what C++ does. And uh, um, because it's relying on, on LLVM, it just uh, emits the same instructions and intrinsics that, that Clang would use. And um, right, this order, memory ordering spec of, of, um, of C11 is actually pretty great because it includes a very nice uh, overview of cache coherency um, and also uh, explains to you what it means for things to be ordered before other things. And if you basically understand the modification order, evaluation order, and um, these different flavors of, of uh, before relations, then you will eventually arrive at uh, things like release acquire pairs or sequential consistency, which are one of the most basic building blocks of concurrent data structures. Um, so highly recommended. And um, with this in mind, we can actually think a bit about how our queue behaves. So um, since uh, basically I said uh, in the first part that our MPSC queue is just, an, uh, is just a collection of different FIFO buffers, uh, one for each producer. So we can actually look at an isolated case where we have the single producer only. And in the single producer, single consumer case, um, the semantics are quite simple. So what happens when you want to push data to the queue? Um, 
So you have a tail and a head, and the producer, um, the producer pushes data to the queue by first writing to the buffer and then incrementing the head. Actually, it needs to read the tail, read the head, calculate the capacity, then it writes data to the uh, queue and then increments the head. So the head index is not allowed to be modified uh, before the producer is finished writing data. So this is your first uh, ordering that you need to um, enforce in your code. Um, and similarly, the consumer, um, the consumer generally what it does, it, it reads the tail and the head, sees if there are elements present, then it reads data from the queue, and after it's done, it needs to increment the tail. So uh, basically when you explain yourself, um, or explain to yourself uh, the, how the queue is, or how any data structure is supposed to work, whenever you use this has to happen before this, uh, then you know where you need to put your release acquire pairs. So the consumer uh, basically needs to read the data and finish reading it, and then only increment the tail. And uh, the nice thing here is that we actually have no competing store operations on either tail or heads. So that means we don't need any type of atomic read copy up, update, read modify write primitives like CAS or LLSC. Um, we can just keep it simple with release acquire. So uh, this is a um, pseudo code example of how a push and pop would work. And there are two release acquire pairs here, but I would like to focus on one of them. Um, so here, in the, first, uh, in the first case on the left, we have a push uh, function. And in the push function, we write data. Like this is basically the, the third line it says, um, write data to the queue, and then update the index. So this is the first ordering we want to have. Um, and when we say ordering, we, we say we want an, an external, like an, another process that runs on another processor to observe them in that order. Um, and the same thing goes for the pop. We want to read an index and then read data. And uh, this is a bit, uh, th that's actually a bit annoying. So the thing is, how can you read the data if you, if, if you did not uh, read the index before? Because the index is, um, determines the address from which you perform the read. So how can this ever be reordered? And, and the answer is that um, this is a wrong question to ask because you're not developing against the processor or architecture semantics. You're developing against language semantics. And the C11 memory spec has no notion of address dependency or control dependency. These things happen on the computer architecture level. So if you, if you make uh, certain assumptions, about how these things uh, like are supposed to be ordered based on some kind of dependency, uh, then you're already committing the first cardinal sin. And uh, yeah, this is something that happened to me. Just because you can't observe it on most architectures does not mean that your code is technically not undefined behavior. Um, this is something that's very hard to accept, but uh, yeah. And uh, this is how it would look like basically here we have the release and acquire, and the same thing you will have a second time in this code. And uh, with that, we, we can now assume that um, the code is mostly correct for this push and pop operation. And now we can think a bit about how to make it a bit more performant. Uh, because as long as the concurrency works, uh, the rest can be relatively well handled. Um, and I, I like to start with the first bread and butter optimization that you want to have, um, which is the avoidance of false sharing. So I said previously that we employ this optimization of, of, uh, called struct of arrays, where we have all of the offsets of our queue stored in the uh, first part of our allocation, which means they're all packed together. And this is an example. Uh, obviously, we wouldn't choose such big offsets, but let's say we have 64-bit uh, tails and heads, eight producers, and all of them packed together, so they would occupy two 64-byte cache lines. And um, so in the second cache line, uh, the interesting thing is like, let's say all of the producers at once are modifying, um, modifying the state, pushing data to the queue, and then updating the heads concurrently. Uh, what happens then is that every single processor will consist, con con constantly claim um, exclusive access to this cache line, and then the cache coherence protocol will cause lots of invalidations, and cache coherency traffic will completely saturate the interconnect. Um, which causes terrible latency. So this is actually, uh, if you have massive cache line, uh, like false sharing, 
and massively invalidate all of these cache lines. What you're essentially doing is you're locking on a hardware level. Um, it's just not that noticeable. And uh, right, the, the best way to avoid it is to have every head or tail, every offset occupy its own cache line. And you do that by adding padding or aligning um, your uh, offsets. Depends on how you want to think about it. Um, so here you have some kind of dead space. There's no data in there. And every single tail and head occupy their own cache line. So there is no false sharing here. Um, now, there is actually uh, an interesting other way you can think about this. So um, this fully padded version has actually one downside. Um, namely, we, we have a multi-producer single consumer case. So we have one consumer and it pops all of the data of all of the producers of their queues at once. So um, we don't actually have false sharing on the consumer side in this case. That means that it might make sense in certain cases to pack tightly all of the tails together. So this is like a bit of a hybrid layout. And in this case, what we can do is we can have the consumer uh, first read all of the tails and then after it's done, uh, polling all the queues and um, performing all the reads that it needs. Once it needs to update the tails, it can update all of them at the same time and it can use an atomic, atomic batch operation. And for batch updates, that's just a single uh, transaction on the like for the cache currency protocol. So this is just like one write, um, which is very nice. And you will see this optimization in lots of log-free, weight-free uh, uh, algorithms where um, you're using, you're trying to be very frugal with uh, the size of your pointers in some cases, because then you can perform batch updates. Um, and uh, this would be an example of how you would implement the former case in Rust. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, but uh, there's one difference, and that is that, uh, like, um, basically, um, uh, reading a shared cache line does not invalidate it. So, basically, I was thinking if you have one consumer and 32 producers, all of them updating the tail, uh, all of them updating the um, queue they're not going to cause invalidations, uh, that's why. Um, right, I also thought about it. I also measured both of them, so just to be sure. Uh, uh, right, but it's a very good point. Uh, that's actually uh, another thing, uh, depending on your data structure, you should obviously optimize, um, particularly for, for the way your data is accessed. So I could only make this optimization because I knew I had a single consumer, otherwise that would not work. And uh, if you want to implement it in Rust, uh, you just align. So what I did was I had a 16-bit integer. I new type it with a tail or head um, struct, and then just align it with this um, like proc macro and uh, this attribute. And then once you include it in an array, it will automatically happen like that. So uh, the thing that also might be interesting. So the 64 is hard coded, and uh, it's not a it's not a variable that you can set. It's not a constant because um, this stuff is replaced on the AST level, so um, yeah, it's also an intrinsic for the Rust compiler. Uh, what you could do, however, you could use uh, either the config attribute macro, or you use the crossbeam util crate. Uh, crossbeam is a crate which um, has lots of these high-performance concurrent data structure imp um, implementations that are not as cursed as mine and uh, like well written. And they have all kinds of these utilities. So cache padded is just a wrapper, and it makes sure that your whatever you wrapped is properly aligned depending on your architecture. So uh, if you are an Intel, it will um, sorry. If you are an x86, it will actually uh, align everything to a 128 byte cache line, because they said uh, in the documentation that they are uh, worried about the hardware prefetcher pulling data in. I'm not sure. I, I didn't observe any difference, so uh, that's why I usually chose, choose, just choose 64 byte. And uh, I recently wrote also a blog post in which I documented some of these problems with false sharing. Um, yeah, this was basically a benchmark, and on the left side you can see the, the left graph shows the maximum contention. So you have all nine producers um, constantly pushing data to a queue, and you can see the performance penalties like 6x to 10x sometimes. Um, and that's, that's the latency that we're actually trying to avoid. So by reducing um, like false sharing, 
we're actually um, getting lots of latency improvements. And of course, if you don't have much contention, then you're not going to have much of a penalty of false sharing. But then again, why are we doing weight-free producer, producer and consumer use? Uh, we're trying to uh, uh, optimize for the high contention case because we would try to have a like a limit to how much latency we incur. Otherwise, we could just use locking. And um, this is generally a thing, if you don't have much contention, uh, locking can sometimes be much faster. Yeah. What's the x-axis here? Sorry, yeah. <laughs> Um, the x-axis is the number of producers, and uh, there are two bars. One is gray, one is white. The gray one is the packed layout, um, which where, where all of them are like in one cache line. And the hybrid layout is the thing I showed, where you have only the tails packed, but the head uh, aligned to a button cache line. And um, yeah, right. I, uh, yeah. If you follow the link, then you will see all kinds of pictures for different um, uh, for different architectures and different numbers of, of producers. But I didn't manage to add the axis in um, matplotlib. Didn't know how to do it. Uh, right. Uh, right. Uh, so I spoke earlier about uh, this, uh, this ability to do an atomic batch update. So let's say all of your tails are tightly packed into a single small area, then you can do a very efficient update. But this means you need to be you need to have a very small footprint for your indices. You can't just have them be 64-bit pointers. So uh, one very commonly used optimization here is use pointer compression. You often use pointer compression together with this uh, uh, batch update. And the pointer compression just means that uh, we're reducing the addressing granularity of our queue. So uh, if we have a normal index like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, um, we just shift it by 1 um, to the right. And now we have um, like basically uh, more... Uh, actually, what we do is we mask the last bit. So now the 0 and the 1 and the 2 refer to either the first element or the second. And the first, like number 1, refers to 2 or 3. Number 2 refers to 4 or 5. So what we do is with a smaller, uh, uh, with a smaller um, like, uh, amount of numbers, we can address a larger amount of memory. And the problem is that uh, we lose accuracy. So um, the simplest one would be a Boolean, um, which would be just one massive uh, index that, that basically says if your queue is empty or full. That's not very helpful. Uh, so you need to choose something in between. And uh, reducing this addressing granularity has one downside, but many, many upsides. So uh, this is how it would look like. In the first example, you have uh, like the accurate tail of the queue, which is right stored there. And uh, on the left side, you have three empty, like three places where you can put elements inside. And uh, in the second case, this is what the producer, for instance, would see. So this would be a compressed index. And uh, because we need to be uh, pessimistic when it comes to the addressing, um, the only thing that the producer sees is that this the, the tail is at, at uh, position one. And that means that for the producer, it looks like there's only space left for two elements. And uh, yeah, so basically we're wasting one element uh, worth of space if we compress the index by one. And um, that only happens if our queue is very full. So we do waste space in this case, but generally you want bounded queues to be on average pretty empty. Uh, if they have, uh, if they're expected to be uh, filled to some degree, then you're actually operating on a boundary, like on, on, on the edge of failure, uh, almost constantly. So um, this type of uh, like memory waste is actually not that bad. And uh, to give you an example, for instance, you could uh, choose your indices or like your buffer size to be. Um, uh, let, let, imagine you have 16-bit indi indices. So 16-bit can only address 65k discrete uh, uh, number of elements, a different number of elements. Uh, but if you use a pointer compression of like four bits, then you can address address 20-bit uh, worth of elements, which would be something like 200 megabytes, which is plenty in many cases. Um, but we can still use 16-bit uh, uh, indices, and we're in this case we lose. Uh, four bits worth of addressing, which only happens like in this full case. So this is really not a problem. And this is uh, how it would look like. So you have the consumer, 
and it has a shared tail and a local tail. The local tail is the accurate tail. It's the one here on the top. And uh, the shared tail is the compressed index. So it's the thing that the producer sees. It's the thing that makes the producer um, uh, aware of how much data is still allowed to be inserted into the queue. And uh, yeah, so when you update the tail, you just write to the accurate tail the actual value. And when you want to submit it, you just do an ordering release and uh, update a compressed version of this tail. Um, right, any questions? Okay. Uh, another optimization that you can uh, do is uh, to, to use uh, caching uh, of offsets. So uh, if you actually um, perform very clever uh, types of caching, you can avoid, uh, avoid in many cases ca cache coherency traffic. And sometimes then the false sharing avoidance actually has downsides. Uh, doesn't happen often, but um, you need to measure all the effects of performances uh, of performance improvements uh, it all together, not individually. So local caching is uh, pretty uh, simple to imagine. So you have a, let's say we have a queue, and this is from the perspective of the producer. That's important. So on the left side you have a tail, on the right side you have a head, in the middle some elements. And the producer just pushed these elements to the queue. Now, um, in the next moment, um, basically, the, um, that's all the, uh, the producer remembers. So it does not know where the tail currently is. Like after having pushed to, to the queue, anything could have happened. Um, so right now, it doesn't know exactly where the tail is. It ha would have to read again. But we do know from the semantics of our, uh, of our, of our ring buffer that the consumer is only allowed to increment the tail until it hits the head, which means that we can just assume the worst case, assume that the tail has not changed, the consumer has not popped any data off, and just add data to the queue until uh, we reach the old position of the tail, at which point we then perform the read operation and possibly reveal more data that is free to be pushed. So, uh, yeah, in this case, and, and also, if the queue is very, very long, uh, you're going to reduce your uh, atomic reads on the tail by orders of magnitude. So this is a great optimization. Um, and this is going to yield l lots of benefits if your queue is especially large. Yeah. So the producer can uh, submit more than one element. Yeah. I, I should also say that uh, okay, the way I designed my queue, it, it was supposed to be a, a, like a serial port debugger kind of, and also a tracing tool. And what I did was I submitted variable size byte slices. Uh, so I didn't submit um, like, like a certain number of, of uh, uh, number of elements that were at a certain size. So uh, the push and pop operations are actually big mem copies. Um, right. Uh, this, uh, this also uh, might change the effectiveness of certain operations. Like in my case, I could do mem copies because I only care about strings that are stored in here, um, right? And that also impacts the like logic of uh, the linearizability of my queue. Uh, but um, uh, now I'd like to talk about something a bit more Rust specific. So uh, the nice thing in Rust is that we have quite a few tools to uh, to to create safe abstractions, because. Uh, in, in many of those cases, you will have to deal with raw pointers and raw allocations, and um, it can get quite ugly. So it's very nice if you can ensure that the user-facing side of your API is fully fully safe. This is the idea of REST. And um, there are some problems. So the first one is that the borrow checker and the lifetimes in general, they can't reason about any kind of um, arbitrary uh, concurrent data structure. They you have to help it. So uh, that's actually the reason why you will see lots of interior mutability um, things and unsafe cell. And um, the reason for, for these uh, constructs is, is that the borrow checker has limits. And um, yeah, basically, atomic, uh, atomics are the best example. Uh, you, can share, uh, you can share a shared reference uh, that's, that's not mutable to all kinds of threads completely safely and then perform actually mutation. That's, that's an example of interior mutability. And uh, a lot of times when you're writing your handmade concurrent data structures, you will have to uh, 
um, think about these things, uh, how to uh, present mutability, shared mutability to your users um, without breaking the safety guarantees and especially aliasing guarantees. Um, right, so in my case, uh, the multi-producer single consumer queue is a big, uh, big block, like an allocation block. And what I then create is uh, lots of new types that I draw from uh, pointers and regions that I calculate from this big allocation. And the first thing that is very helpful in those cases is to use very, uh, very semantically meaningful new types. So, um, like if you have certain types of uh, like, um, integer types, it's nice to new type those, uh, atomic types, and um, for instance, let's say you have a pointer to an atomic uh, variable, then um, it's quite practical to create a new type that um, basically states that you are allowed to read and write it, or you're only allowed to read it. So you can actually encode the permissions in there. And then also the benefit of new typing is that you can uh, put in const generics, which uh, maybe the const generics might characterize your data structure. And then uh, with this, you can uh, basically keep track of your uh, of the semantics of your queue and uh, how to perform masking and um, you can place assertions everywhere and this basically hinders you from accidentally mixing up certain pointers uh, all, all in your code base. So this would be an example of how a consumer or producer in my queue would look like if you use these nice new types and you, you can immediately think about the semantics of the queue which is the consumer is only allowed to read from the buffer, not to write to it, and also only uh, allowed to read the head. But it's allowed to modify all the tails. So we have read write tail, read only head, read only buffer. And for the producer, everything is exactly flipped. So we have read write head, read write buffer, but read only tail. So already this um, presents lots of uh, uh, safety features. And the other thing is const generics. Uh, if you do have the uh, luxury of having compile time known constant sizes, um, then you can use, uh, just, just pass in lots of these const generics to your queue. For instance, in my, my case, I, I encoded the number of producers, the bit size of the queue, the number of bytes in total, and the number of bytes per producer in, in this generic. And uh, the nice thing here is that, uh, basically, it, it allows me to keep track of all of these uh, things without any kind of memory footprint and I, it allows me to pass all of those generics then to all of the new types that I create um, for, all of, for instance all of these pointers so and there's very little possibility of mix-up there is one problem and that is that's very unergonomic to write and it uh, looks extremely ugly so uh, one way that you can fix this is by maybe using proc macros but ideally you would use something like const generic expressions which is um, you could say Rust's limited support of dependent types, but it's an unstable feature. It's not supported very well. It's actually supposed to be deprecated soon uh, for something else. So um, yeah, this is unfortunately. But if you're interested in Idris, which is a dependently typed programming language, I highly recommend it if you are into this const generic style of programming. And right. So the next one would be uh, something known as RAII. Um, I'm not sure if there is an acronym in, in Rust uh, for this, but we can think a bit about our POP operation for the consumer. So uh, what the consumer does, it, it, it reads into the queue, which is just a byte buffer, and well, it needs to read from it, and then one, one thing we could do is we could copy data from it, because this memory is volatile, it's ring buffer, it gets overwritten, so we have limited time to do something with it. Uh, one way would be to... Um, like uh, read from it by, by copying it and returning a vector. So uh, one problem here is that you have a heap allocation, um, which is maybe not ideal. As in some cases, you don't even have a heap. So uh, and also you don't really can, you can't really specify the amount of bytes you expect. For instance, maybe you want only five bytes, then you need to make your type signature more complex. Maybe this is not the best idea. Um, another thing that is very C-like. I don't know, I, I didn't write much C, but I think that's how it works. Like you pass a mutable reference to, to some kind of byte buffer to the queue, and then the queue populates it. I mean, actually the consumer then populates it and returns to you the number of bytes uh, written to it. Um, this is quite nice because here you can specify how many bytes you're allowed to 
expecting to accept. Um, however, this is, ha has some problems because you're still copying, um, which is not what you might want to do. Sometimes you want to read uh, through your queue and uh, process, this, uh, process all of these bytes and uh, perform maybe some kind of transformation or aggregate or sum, some kind of computation. Um, so this is, uh, copy is completely useless. Um, another thing, probably the best thing that you would like to have is for the pop operation to return a slice, uh, just a byte slice, a reference to this particular section which has data to be read. And uh, this is almost perfect, except um, we bound the lifetime here to the consumer itself. By the way, all of those are associative functions in the consumer struct. So, uh, yeah, the problem is because we bound the lifetime to it, um, we can only really, um, we, we basically need to hold on to this byte slice until the end of the consumer, which means this is at the time where you deallocate the structure. This is quite useless. Um, you need to, after being done with reading this data, somehow tell the consumer, okay, I'm done. Now increment the tail atomically. I don't need the data anymore. And uh, this is exactly where this RAII pattern helps. So one thing you can do is you can wrap the, like the return type, instead of having a, like a reference into a buffer, like a, sorry, a reference uh, of a byte slice, you have a new type in which you include this byte slice, but you implement a custom drop handler in this is, is something I would call section, for instance. So it points to a particular part of your, um, of this shared queue, and um, after you, uh, after you basically drop the section object, then the custom drop handler runs, which atomically increments the tail. So this is a way to claim um, transient, like very short term uh, ownership over a certain part of this um, byte, like this big backing array, and then just give it away again by using this drop handler. And uh, this is one example of how it would, uh, for instance, look like in my queue. So you have a, in the first, you, first, in the first line you allocate a queue, in the second line you push data to it. On the third line it becomes interesting, uh, you open a scope and in this scope you create a section by popping off uh, parts of this, uh, by, by letting the consumer pop off a part of this queue. And now you can actually take the section, which is just a, basically a, uh, has, uh, just holds a reference to a byte slice, and then you just iterate over it. And here you can do anything. You can also copy it if you want. You can just perform a clone. Uh, or you iterate over it and do some kind of transformation. And uh, afterwards, when you leave the scope, it gets dropped. So um, then the tail gets atomically updated. And yeah, this, this type of pattern is very common also in C++. So this is not too Rust specific, but it's very practical because uh, this is also how oftentimes you will clean up mutex or mutexes or mutex guards or any kind of lock guards or file handlers. So if you need to perform some resource management, oftentimes you will new type something, then implement a custom drop handler. And uh, the interesting thing is here that in this pop, a signature, so in this in the middle, um, we actually take a mutable reference to the consumer as a parameter, a mutable reference, which means that this prevents us from making one mistake that C++ can't prevent us from, uh, which is if we create um, another section while this previous section is still active, we actually um, we, we try to call this pop operation, we pass an immutable reference uh, of our consumer, and then uh, what happens is that we uh, at this point have two overlapping lifetime regions that both have a mutable reference to the consumer. So this gets rejected by the borrow checker. Um, so we can't, uh, yeah, if, if, if this was allowed, we would create horrible data races and this would not be safe to use. Uh, but Rust protects us from that because we can use mutable references. Right, uh, anyone, questions, yeah? Basically, yeah, yeah. I mean, the drop handler is basically similar to a destructor. Uh, Right. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if, if the Rust community maybe has another term. It's the same? Okay, good. Perfect. Makes it simpler. Uh, yeah, right. Any other questions?
So the black box you inserted, so that the non-lexical line tag doesn't fix the problem. Yes, yes, exactly, right. Uh, so I have this big scope, but unfortunately, actually fortunately, uh, lifetimes are not restricted by scope. We have this NLL. Uh, but so I added this black box here that we force the first section to have the lifetime across this whole scope. Um, this is important. Uh, yeah, actually, um, this would be safe to use if I didn't use this uh, section at the bottom again. Any other question? Okay, with this in mind, uh, so just to think a bit back, uh, we, we had a look at some optimizations, memory model. Uh, the thing is, even with those in mind, even if you know what you're doing, uh, it, it, it still might happen that you cause some kind of undefined behavior because you're just making programming mistakes. And uh, even the border checker can't uh, help you with that. So uh, runtime analysis. Oh fuck, uh, helps a lot, yeah. So I have three cases uh, that happened to, uh, to me. And um, first, the, one of the greatest tools ever uh, in, in the history of Rust, probably Miri, because it is a uh, interpreter for the MIR, um, which is an intermediate representation of, 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 uh, of Rust, and it checks for all of these kinds of horrible undefined behavior, uh, includes, including the like aliasing model. And one example for me was that uh, I had an issue with unanalyzed arrays. So basically, I had an array, I zeroed it, I assigned a value to it, and this caused horrible problems. And I didn't realize why. And it turns out that the drop checker actually runs when you assign a value to an array, like the drop checker of the old value runs. And I never realized that because I only dealt with arrays of PODs, like plain old data types. Uh, but my producer actually has um, atomic ref counting logic in there. So actually zeroing it is not considered. Uh, uh, zeroing the producer is causing the producer to not uh, be a valid object. Um, right, so, so being uh, cognizant of your semantics uh, like of, of the invariance that certain uh, objects have to uphold is very important. The other thing is um, dangling pointers. So because it's a ring buffer, if I want to push lots of elements, I have to maybe perform a splitting mem copy. Where I have to do two mem copies, one at the end of the queue and one at the start. And uh, so here, this is like one downside of the constant generics. And uh, basically this was the code. This was my first mem copy and my second mem copy. And in the second one, I... Uh, like these two terms have to be equal, but there was a C instead of an L, which blew up. Um, so this is something that Miri protected me from, which is very valuable. This is very hard to spot. Uh, and the other thing is uh, something that I'm sure all of you are familiar with. It's called the racy imperfectly overlapping atomic access violation. It's like the, one of the classic errors that you find every day. Um, I think looking through the audience, some of you are looking like this. Uh, Basically, you had a. What I did was I had 32-bit integers at some point. Then I used hard-coded offsets to calculate some position in an array, which is horrible. And uh, then I switched because of uh, using this co pointer compression optimization. I switched to smaller bit sizes, uh, which caused my code to blow up because I would uh, perform atomic uh, operations uh, in an overlapping way. And now my super fast conclusion. Take your time. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, Right, so uh, basically, um, I would like to make some key observations, and that is that um, first, you should be cognizant of the language's semantic model. Uh, basically, when you develop, uh, especially concurrent code, uh, you should know if you're developing against a certain um, com computer architecture or if you're using uh, the language semantics to develop against those to create portable code. If you do create portable code, uh, you're generally not allowed to. Uh, rely on undefined behavior. If you do want to rely on undefined behavior, then you need to pin the compiler version, which most people don't want to do. So, um, yeah. And, and there's also another thing hidden here, which is that uh, in, in safe Rust, you have lots of guarantees that you might sometimes maybe take for granted. So, uh, things that go way beyond the shared XOR mutable uh, idea of the borrow checker, because you have like safe transmute rules, drop checking, you have, um, you have this shared uh, like aliasing models, stack borrows, uh, pointer provenance, um, yeah, many things that, uh, and also the memory model, which is unspecified. So there are many of these foot guns, which makes unsafe. Sometimes many people say that it's much harder to write than C. So the Nomicon is actually a really good starting point because it will uh, lead you to all the ways in, you, in which you can like write better unsafe code and 
writing better unsafe code is also nice because that means we have more people who can audit unsafe code, which is uh, in itself quite valuable. Um, the other thing would be to familiarize yourself with the memory models that underpin your stack, uh, meaning that uh, you need to be, uh, yeah, basically it's the same with the being awareness, having awareness of the language's semantic model. Um, you, you should be just aware uh, that maybe you might have some presuppositions about how memory works. Uh, for instance, thinking about in terms of order dependencies or address dependencies when you're writing code is actually uh, one of these foot guns that you might not realize, uh, which I didn't. And uh, RAI and lifetimes, you can use them to create safe view types. So a lot of times you will see a pattern where you create a huge allocation blob, block and then derive um, yeah, basically all of these kinds of handlers that somehow point into it and then you have all kinds of cleanup logic in, in drop handlers and uh, that will protect you. Uh, in this case I would actually say memory waste is a powerful trade-off. So there is certain instances of memory uh, waste or fragmentation that I made use of. First, all of our producers have a fixed size. Um, so a lot of times, depending on your workload, you have to choose a size that is very large. Um, so and oftentimes you need to waste space just to accommodate this uh, case of your queues filling up because you don't want to have this fail on overflow behavior. Another thing is that all of the producers have the same size, they can't grow, uh, which only makes sense if you have homogeneous utilization. Another thing is pointer compression, where you have, like, you reduce the addressing granularity of your queue, uh, but thereby wasting a bit of space because the queue can't be filled up 100%. And another thing is actually, this is very uh, practical in switch-like control flow, uh, things. This is very practical for compilers. If you have certain routines and you have a switch and all of these uh, subroutines have a fixed size that, or a bounded size, you can actually, uh, um, they actually create a hard-coded jump table that doesn't cause any cache miss. And this is very practical for creating interrupt, uh, vectored interrupts if you don't have a, a vectored interrupt support on your architecture for some reason. So those are like uh, quite a few examples and in concurrent data structures they are very helpful. And uh, the last one is learn from the OGs. And uh, what I mean with this is that there are so many valuable, uh, knowledgeable people in the community, like Discord, Reddit, Zulub, especially people in the compiler team. They're a bunch of nerds who love to share and uh, write blogs and stuff. So uh, this is great. And, and if you do have something interesting uh, that you learned, then uh, by all means uh, share it, because that's how we uh, as a community become better at writing code. And this is uh, my last. Um, a recommendation. This is uh, a guy called John, I'm not going to butcher his name, and uh, he uh, has a great video on memory orderings. So I highly recommend it. Yeah, thanks for watching. Yeah. Right, thank you. Very much. Very interesting. I think I have to check my code on R now. <laughs> Do we have any questions? One. Meta question, I guess, but uh, you mentioned you are running with this on this. So, what are you actually using the whole thing for? Uh, what I'm using this thing for? Yeah, like, so like uh, the actual response to, to see what? Uh, uh, basically, I'm, I'm writing a like bare metal operating system, mm -hmm. and uh, basically, it's a unikernel, and uh, I want to write it specifically targeted for server architecture. Um, but now that nowadays we don't have risk five servers yet, uh, like proper high performance cores. But uh, you know, maybe in five years or something. So basically, I'm preparing for this event. Uh, <laughs> Thanks for the talk. I was wondering about this. Alpha architecture, which is mm -hmm. very lax uh, requirements. Is there any way for you to like simulate this architecture, or would Miri kind of catch the, the things? Or? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, so for the alpha, I don't think so. But uh, we, we Miri does have a weak memory model emulation, and actually, what they do is, uh, yeah, basically they're they're emulating a weak memory model, and uh, they're using all kinds of uh, supportive structures to enforce that. So uh, uh, you actually um, would be uh, benefiting a lot uh, by, by just running it on Miri and not so much uh, as running it on maybe 
like an embedded system that is, has a weaker memory model. I, in this case, I actually recommend MIRI, but it's very slow. So you need to have benchmarks that really um, like are able to perform enough work for it to catch it. Can we consider, uh, do you think it would be useful to encode the, the file and the line location in the message and instead of sending the message over the queue to send the files, let's say, ID and the line ID? Do you think that, that would be useful to, to reduce the traffic? Ah, like making sure that the messages are small and concise. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, yeah. Uh, Although, like, it depends. Uh, I mean, in some cases, maybe you're debugging uh, dynamic data that you need to output. And, but so, okay, so I was working on fixed read and I was working over serial, and it's in real time, and it's just helping. Mm, yeah, this is a, yeah, it's a really good suggestion. Yeah, I was mostly thinking of like, pure messages, but if you actually want to build a working, like, proper debugger, like a software that other people would actually use, then uh, this is a really good idea. Yeah. Final question. Or snacks. <laughs> There's no black in here. <laughs> well, it's a morbid curiosity. Right. Yeah, since you, you were, yeah, someone mentioned alpha, and I noticed on the on the slide it was actually one of the the, the, the instructions where none of the architecture was there in we were only is this uh, actually, <laughs> is actually that, that it, it makes no sense to reorder this technical instruction, or is it, is it the older there? I mean, uh, you could make the argument that what the alpha is doing is also doesn't make much sense, but uh, yeah, technically you can reorder anything. Um, okay. Yeah, yes, yes, basically, um, hmm. because, uh, because uh, like the reordering mostly refers to um, like how uh, how other processors in the multi-core system uh, are looking at uh, certain operations from the outside. So uh, yeah, basically uh, all of these things are documenting uh, what kind of states are observable for an outside viewer. And uh, in many cases, what is observable is complete nonsense. So in that sense, yeah, yeah I think that is possible. But I actually don't know if this has ever been done. Uh, but the, the reference, McKinney, it's called is parallel programming hard and if so what can we do about it it's a it's a great uh, like a summary of all kinds of the stuff and you will find more information there i highly recommend it um, this concludes our session thank you again uh, nice round of the clock we'll be over there um, thank you again to Tuke for the snacks uh, they will arrive are here they're here. Wonderful. So, final round of applause, and I hope to see you next time at the ATH.